Our distinguished guest speaker for this evening is Mr. Jared Isaacman. Mr. Isaacman is the CEO of Shift4 Payments, the leader in integrated payment processing solutions. He is an accomplished pilot, rated to fly commercial and military aircraft, and was the commander of Inspiration4, the world's first all-civilian mission to space. Mr. Isaacman founded Shift4 Payments in 1999 at the age of 16 in the basement of his parents' home. Today, Shift4 handles more than $200 billion in payments annually for a third of the country's restaurants, hotels, and casinos. Shift4 provides technology solutions for more than 200,000 businesses and has over a dozen offices across the U.S. and Europe. In 2020, Shift4 Payments went public on the New York Stock Exchange and currently trades under the ticker symbol 4. In 2012, Mr. Isaacman co-founded Draken International, a provider of tactical aviation services for all branches of the U.S. military, Department of Defense, and global allied militaries. With a fleet of 150 tactical fighter aircraft, Draken owns and operates the world's largest commercial fleet of ex-military aircraft to support military training objectives around the globe. Mr. Isaacman sold the company in 2019 to the Blackstone Group and remained CEO until early 2020. Inspiration4 took place on September 15th through the 18th of 2021, marking several, import several important milestones in human spaceflight history. The mission, named Inspiration4 in recognition of the four-person crew's mission to inspire support for St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, sent a humanitarian message of possibility. The journey lasted three days, reached an orbital altitude of approximately 585 kilometers, and was the highest of any crewed flight in 20 years. Inspiration4 represented a new era for human spaceflight and exploration while raising over $240 million for St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. In February of 2022, Mr. Isaacman announced an additional three missions planned with SpaceX called the Polaris Program. He will serve as the mission commander of the first mission, Polaris Dawn. These three missions will continue to raise funds and awareness for St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. Mr. Isaacman holds several world records, including a speed around the world flight to raise money and awareness for the Make-A-Wish Foundation. He has flown in over 100 air shows as part of the Black Diamond Jet Team, dedicating every performance to a charitable cause. As part of Inspiration 4's public outreach, Mr. Isaacman, Mr. Isaacman made a personal $125 million commitment to St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Jared Isaacman. Academy for coming and talking with us today. Uh, to get into it, founder and CEO of Shift4, and you began this company when you were only 16 years old. So throughout your life, how has your perspective on leadership and organizational management changed, or maybe you view things differently now uh, with experiences and situations you've been through in your life? Yeah, uh, good questions. At first, um, I just want to say what a real honor it is to be here. Uh, I've looked at the lineup of speakers, and you have some really in incredible people that are coming to talk to you over the last uh, few days. So I know I'm not worthy. I'll do my, I'll do my best. Um, I also wanted to say that like I need to, um, I need to amend that bio that you you uh, read because uh, probably one of the, the coolest things that I've been fortunate enough to experience is going through the AM490 program here. So <laughs> free fall. Um, yeah, I uh, you know just talking back to the you know, early days, the, the basement story, um, there's nothing, in, at least in, in business, uh, there's nothing cooler than, than a basement startup. Like, uh, I mean, that's, what an, what an incredible moment. You have like a handful of people eating Chinese food till like four in the morning. You're, um, everybody, like the commun communication is, uh, is, is, is flawless. Like everybody knows what's going on. You're sharing in each other's successes and failures. You're, you're learning very quickly, uh, but it doesn't stay that way. Uh, so inevitably, you know, if you if you've found opportunity and figured out how to solve a problem or um, or make a, a better uh, better solution to an existing one, you uh, you grow as an organization. You start scaling, and uh, all those uh, amazing benefits you had as a as a as a startup go away. You start hiring a lot of people, people who weren't there the entire time. Your team grows. Now you have to start introducing like real red tape, you know, procedures, process. Um, and, uh, and you become less efficient. 
uh, but that's uh, to some extent inevitable. But there are things you can do and, and you learn as you go, like how do you preserve, preserve some of those things that were uh, so beneficial in the earliest days, like very flat organization structure. So you can still try and be effective commun with, with communication. You, um, uh, you can make decisions faster. You empower employees, uh, team members to, you know, they may have to follow a procedure to get there, but they'll be able to execute very quickly and with urgency. So you try and take what, what you can, like, uh, and hold on to it with, with dear life that made, that made you special in the first place as a startup. And, and try and ensure it at least remains part of the DNA as the organization eventually uh, grows. And it's hard, it's really hard. A lot of organizations change over time from those early days as they progress. But um, yeah, it's, uh, it's quite a journey when you're, when you're on it. Yes, sir. So would you say, in terms of teamwork, how, is that, uh, how does that impact teamwork on a day-to-day -day basis within the organization? Do you think it strengthens it, weakens it? I mean, what, what is the impact of that? Um, Okay, everything just has to become that much more, you, you have to be that much better, and every, every factor becomes that much more important as an organization grows and scales because you're not all you know, sharing your successes and failures at 2 a.m. eating Chinese food. Like it's, uh, so like the strength of the organization, having real you know, A players becomes um, so much more important. Um, you know, making sure that you put together like good, again, process and procedures so that you know, teams can execute very, very quickly, make good decisions and not be needlessly um, delayed or impaired in the progress they're trying to, uh, you know, the progress they're trying to make. So, yeah, I guess it's just, you know, when you start and it's small, a lot of amazing things can happen. But once, uh, once you get ignition there and it starts, you know, gaining momentum, inevitably more and more people come in, more teams, people who weren't there with you from the beginning have less of an understanding of things. Um, and you have to fall back on these guardrails that you put in place in order to get to the right place. Um, teamwork, of course, is like, you know, a critical component to that. Um, but uh, it's a challenge. It's a fun one uh, when, you, when you kind of embark upon it. But, um, yeah. Absolutely. Taking those lessons learned on leadership and teamwork, applying that to over 100 demonstration flights in fighter jets, how is that in working as a very close team? I mean, no margin for error. How has that been an impact in what you've learned from Shift 4? Yeah, so I've been really lucky and fortunate to be able to interact uh, and be part of some really extraordinary organizations. They're all different. Um, and like the leadership skills you need uh, in order to be successful vary so much between them. You know, Shift 4, like it's very, you know, it's a, it's a very normal company in that, you know, you have, uh, again, some really great A players, you have some B players, you try not to have C players. And, and how you navigate that environment is very different than, um, you know, uh, like say SpaceX, that's an organization with nothing but A players that are truly like very mission vision organization with some of the most talented people in the world. Um, you know, how you navigate that is very different. Flying air shows was very different. Uh, you know, everybody there was a like highly experienced pilot, you, you know, which is required in order to have the kind of trust to do that kind of flying, but you have a lot of, a lot of type A personalities, right? Um, which is not diff very different than Draken International where you know, you, is, you, you heard about it, we had over 100 fighter jets um, flying, um, you, know, uh, you know, adversary missions on behalf of the Air Force, Navy, Marine Corps. They were all incredibly experienced aviators. They chose to go into that life versus perhaps going into the airlines, for example. Um, so I think we had, a, I think it was pretty, from like a, you know, elite fighter squadron, probably like 90% of our pilots in that organization were weapons school graduates. So, you, you know, you've got a lot of very experienced type A personalities. So I think what it comes back to, and it's just going to be a recurring theme, is like personality management um, is like a very important skill set in leadership. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I think it's, uh, you know, we're all human. Like, we have our, our highs and lows, and um, people have all sorts of things going on outside in their lives, uh, you know, when they're coming to work, and sometimes it makes its way into the office environment. And how you navigate all of that so people can still be happy, productive, effective is, um, I think, a pretty important skill set. And it, it comes with a kind of experience. Absolutely. And I think military being full of highly motivated, you know, well-rounded individuals, it's sometimes difficult to have that personality management. But it sounds like you're handling it extremely well. Shifting gears a little bit into the space realm. Can you tell us a little bit about how you got involved in the space industry um, and the Inspiration4 mission? Yeah, so uh, I think like a lot of, a lot of kids, I uh, wanted to be an astronaut. Um, but, you know, have a better chance of maybe getting struck by lightning. So uh, what's, uh, what's the next coolest thing? I want to be a pilot. 
And uh, I think Top Gun had something to do with that. And uh, so I started flying, um, you know, as, uh, I guess she's almost uh, 20 years ago. And, um, you know, I, uh, I thought that'd be as good as it gets. Like, just keep building on that, fly air shows. I mean, Drock International, I mean, being uh, professional bad guys is probably the second coolest type of company next to, next to space flight. And, um, and I just, uh, I, I kept like periodically knocking on the door of the early commercial space industry. And um, in 2008, I got invited to uh, Baikonur, uh, Kazakhstan to see a Soyuz launch. And these were with all the early, essentially the leaders of the commercial space industry today. And, uh, and I was like, wow, this might be possible. Like this might happen. It took uh, 12 more years, but I think that's pretty fast by, you know, um, when, when you think about it. And then, um, it was, in, uh, it was in October of 2020, so you're talking before NASA's uh, Crew-1 flight, so before NASA resumed uh, operational human space flight from the United States, uh, Inspiration4 was born. I had no idea um, that I was gonna get a chance to be the first. Uh, that certainly shaped the entire approach to the mission. Um, everything that you, know, you heard about how we went about our crew selection, the, uh, the philanthropic component to it, to basically inspire people that we can have an incredible world for tomorrow, but also we can take care of some of the real problems we have here on Earth. And, and that was kind of how it all happened. It was really largely based on my aviation career and being incredibly lucky, um, and a little bit of the right place at right time. And, uh, and then Inspiration4 happened, and here we are. Awesome, so four crew members, you were the mission commander. As cadets, we often have to practice peer leadership and being both like the leader and a friend, a peer. How do you balance the dichotomy of being both a member and a leader in the same, in the same team? Yeah, I'm, well, first of all, I'm a big, big believer in it. And, um, you know, I can give you a couple examples from how we approach, you know, uh, human space flight as a crew, how SpaceX operates um, as an organization, um, you know, following that process. I mean, just to give you an example, everyone in mission control, um, you know, has a kind of a day job commitment. And they, um, you know, they're engineers in various departments at SpaceX. But in, in mission control, they all have various roles that are very well defined. And it's very often in there that, you know, the mission, the lead mission director, they could have multiple bosses working underneath them uh, as various operators in there. Um, it's uh, very common as they, you know, rotate their responsible engineers around products. Somebody who's, you know, the ultimate, uh, you know, um, uh, accountable party for a particular system or process, um, you know, is, is uh, junior to somebody else who's leading, uh, leading that department. In, in our crew, you know, you have a commander for the overall mission. You have, if there is a fire, uh, you know, some sort of an emergency contingency, some other crew member owns that responsibility and the rest of us are supporting cast. If there is a uh, unsupported uh, splashdown, if there's a medical emergency, I mean, there's a lot of medical related things that can happen in human spaceflight. Like um, that becomes the commander in that moment. And it's not, it's not me. And that, um, I think it's incredibly helpful. It's like, uh, it's a great way to build trust amongst uh, the crew, it's a great way they build trust within, uh, within mission control. Um, and, and I certainly apply, you know, very similar thinking to how we develop uh, our leaders in, uh, in shift four uh, in various roles and responsibilities. Awesome. Yeah, it sounds like one of the most important things as a leader is also to know how to be a follower in the right situation at the right time. Uh, so with the four crew members on Inspiration4, there were kind of four mission pillars um, that that were there and the people were selected based on these mission pillars. So you were obviously leadership. There were also hope, generosity, and prosperity. So how has your philosophy been impacted or changed by your involvement with commercial space and with the Inspiration4 mission? Um, just to find, how has my philosophy changed in what regard? Just in the sense of like, what, what lessons have you learned that maybe are different from your involvement in DOD contracting world, um, the normal business world with Shift 4, um, with commercial space, I mean, we're, we're in outer space. How, what are the lessons that you've taken from there? Um, how has that impacted your views on leadership? Yeah, um, well, I have to say, like, I, uh, I mean, I, I tried to learn as much as I could from SpaceX. I mean, I think it's, you're, you're talking about an extraordinary organization, some of the most talented people um, I've ever, ever seen. Uh, I mean, and, uh, and clearly it shows in the results. I mean, you know, uh, how often in a, you know, technology organization do you have uh, some sort of a major breakthrough and then 
your second place company is what? Months behind, six months behind, you get an iPhone, you get an Android six months later. They started landing rockets on ships in 2015. They've done it well over 100 times. No one else has done it once. That's special. Um, it's, it's a lot of people following very um, well-evolved philosophies to drive results um, that people previously thought um, were impossible. So I felt like it was actually, I mean, you know, a, a real obligation of mine uh, to spend, you know, as much time as I could learning from them and, and where they drive their success. Now, some is not like, it doesn't carry over perfectly, right? Like, um, you know, their, their vision is, um, you know, to make uh, life multi-planetary because the world's just a more interesting place when you can journey among the stars. That's hard to compete with. <laughs> I mean, that's really hard to compete with uh, when you think about it. Um, so you have a collection of talent there uh, that believes um, that they can't make a bigger impact in the world anywhere else than showing up to work uh, every single day. So that, that is some advantage that they have, but there's still a lot of things you can take away from it. Um, you know, uh, and, and we brought a lot of that back into, into, into Shift 4. So just some of their philosophies around executing with urgency, radical ownership, um, you know, deleting the parts, which is, uh, which is more than uh, just like a, a physical part in a machine, but it's, a, it's like a mindset. Um, you know, and, and, and bring that back to, uh, you know, to, to my world, um, you know, my day job, and uh, it's already having an effect. We call it the shift four way, but largely it was drawing on uh, a lot that, um, that SpaceX has really, uh, really developed. But um, you, you learn so much, right? That was just one example of watching such an extraordinary organization operate for a period of time. Um, you know, I, I think like, you know, what do you learn from like actually, you know, human space flight is like, um, we haven't, we've hardly even begun, uh, right? I mean, you, you, you realize like, uh, you know, here on earth, like in, in grade school, like, you know, all the, all the oceans have been crossed, all the mountains have been climbed. Like there's not, not to say by any means that we haven't stopped the learning here on earth because there's an immense amount we still don't understand, but it, we really know nothing uh, um, out in the worlds beyond ours. And um, it just seems like it's, you know, our destiny to go out and, um, and try and answer some of those questions and, and make the world a better place uh, along the way. And I've only been more energized on that notion coming back from, you know, my prior mission. Awesome. Shifting gears a little bit back towards the business sector. So what are some of the differences between leading Draken, uh, DOD contracting realm and shift four um, from, from your perspective as the CEO how do you manage both aspects of that kind of concurrently? Uh, there, is, uh, there is not a lot that carries over from, I'd say, the normal business world into government contracting. <laughs> Can't imagine that's a shock to too many people in the room. Um, the, uh, well, let, let, let's talk about uh, like some, of the, some of the great things. Um, so you're a, uh, a commercial adversary organization of which you are hiring people to uh, modernize and maintain aircraft that did that their entire career. You are hiring pilots, uh, you know, as adversaries that have done that their entire career. So in terms of like uh, a talented group of people that knew the job at an incredibly high level day one, um, that's a gift. You don't normally have that uh, in most, most businesses. You, you know, you're hiring people and you're, you know, uh, you know, teaching them over time and, um, you know, there's career development path, but like they, they generally aren't you know, elite on the first day of the job. Every Draken employee was pretty elite on the first day of the job. Made my life very easy because you could focus more on uh, you know, the, the less than perfect uh, sides of government contracting, which is um, you know, the government does not move uh, very quickly. Now, some of that is by, by design to, um, to have an incredibly uh, fair process, which you know, we bought fighter jets from all over the world. We contract with numerous governments. The US is very fair relative to almost any other nation. Um, but uh, that comes at a cost uh, of a uh, sometimes a very prolonged process. And, um, and I think like obviously to the detriment, right? Because sometimes you might be fielding capabilities that could already be obsolete or you know, at the expense of a, a training opportunity that, um, that, is, that is lost. Um, I'd also say that, um, and, uh, and just to bring it back to, to what we've seen in the space industry of such, um, there is a, uh, there is an over, there's been an over consolidation within the defense industry to, to such an extent that it, I, I actually think it's like a, um, 
uh, it's a real uh, like handicap on our like um, on the competitiveness of the of the nation. And the good news is like um, you're you, you're not seeing that in the in the new space industry, right? So like um, obviously, big SpaceX fan. I think what they've done is truly extraordinary. And when Starship comes online, talk about what a game changer that'll be. But it's the names that you hear. In, in, in this new space world, it's not just SpaceX, right? It's Blue Origin, it's, it's Rocket Labs, it's Relativity with giant 3D printers. How awesome is it to hear names that are new um, and not maybe the same three kind of defense primes that have consolidated like crazy over the years? Um, because that, that, is a, that is a problem. Like uh, competition is like such an important ingredient in a free market and that was, that was kind of one of the things that bothered me and Draken is like, well, it always comes back to the same three companies and it costs a million dollars for them to touch a keyboard versus organizations that are hungry and innovative and like have real feel, you know, there's real risk of failure if they don't deliver like an extraordinary capability um, versus, you know, some that no matter success or failure, they'll always be there. Um, and that's not a good thing. So I, I'd say like that was something I didn't like about gov you know, government contracting and who you, you generally have to work with, but something to, that was incredibly refreshing about, about uh, kind of this new aerospace world where you have all these new energetic companies that are just changing our way of thinking. And, uh, and thank goodness, because as a, as a nation, we need it. So with us as cadets about to enter into the, the government and the air, air and space force, how do you, how do you, what advice would you give to cadets to help implement some of this, you know, agile acquisition, things like that, speeding up the process is kind of getting rid of this rigid structure that we've had um, and implementing maybe some change in that process? Yeah, I think, I think you can probably draw a lot on, uh, you know, Elon is very open about, you know, his design principles. Um, and, and obviously they played out very well for SpaceX, but, you know, starting with, you know, challenging the requirements. Um, you know, looking for opportunities for simplification, deleting the parts. Um, I think that leads to a, a very good outcome. It doesn't have to simply be about what you're, what you're building. But um, I know I certainly was like, I, I mean, give you a great example of like what Draken did. Draken was the 80% solution for like 10% of the cost. I mean, you know, I don't think anyone would say like the, the likely adversary of the future is gonna be flying a bunch of A4 Skyhawks and, you know, Mirage F1s necessarily. Um, but they got a, a, a large quantity uh, of adversaries, and, and quantity can be a quality, as we know, um, and they got it at like literally one-tenth the cost. And, and it served a great purpose, uh, because you're not always necessarily fighting a, like a super fifth-gen adversary or something like that. That is something that um, you don't see very often. It's usually like, you know, let's get to the 100% solution for a thousand percent of the cost. <laughs> And then it gets canceled or, you know, or, or something else that. So I'd say like avoid to the extent possible falling down that trap. And a lot of it is just challenging, I think, a historical way of thinking at times. Um, and I don't know, also kind of looking to some of those new names from, from time to time and seeing who's, who's hungry and capable to maybe change the paradigm. Um, give them a shot. So as, as young officers soon to be, what would you recommend in in promoting some of those changes and suggestions to leadership um, that maybe are more rigid in their thinking and want to stick with things that work well? What are some like respectful ways to maybe help develop that change and be the change? I, I you know, I don't, um, I don't know. I, I, could, I could guess to say that I think oftentimes pointing to in the more respectful way possible of, you know, recent clear cut, you know, successes and examples of when trying something differently, um, you know, has played out very well, you know, for whether it's the good of, uh, you know, the Space Force, the Department of Defense, or just humankind, for example. I, I think, you know, look, uh, no, no, SpaceX had to sue the Air Force to have a chance to do, uh, um, you know, national security launches. And, um, and I think that was a good thing because the only other provider was a joint venture of Boeing and Lockheed and their amazing organizations. But that just uh, joint venture of those two companies just doesn't scream uh, low cost or efficiency necessarily. So, um, you know, that's an example of saying like, look, we, we, we got this one wrong and, and now look, this is, this is played out very well. You know, China put up almost as many orbital launches last year as the United States. And we have rockets that, you know, can land on a ship and fly two weeks later um, in order to get there. Imagine if we didn't, we'd almost certainly have been behind by like a very large quantity of, um, of, of launches. So like, I think you can point to some successes of where like, 
we, got, we may have got this wrong. This might have been an old way of thinking, but look at the payoff as a result. And there are other examples of this too. Um, and I think um, there's also ways to point to, you know, look, this is, this is what we have been doing and maybe, maybe it's not necessarily uh, going to continue to work out well going forward. So I, I, you, I think you'd, you guys would probably be able to navigate the process uh, well. Absolutely. Uh, shifting gears towards Yusuf a little bit, what is one of the most valuable lessons in teamwork that you have learned through all of your different experiences and how can we best implement this as future officers in the air and space forces? You know, I, um, whether it's being part of a, a team or being a leader on a team, I think having um, a very, I think being incredibly self-aware is pretty important. Um, I think we've all encountered teammates and leaders that were um, just jerks. And they probably didn't realize they were. Um, and that's a, that's a problem. Like, you want to get things done. You want to work with people who, um, you know, are, are very inspiring, that are um, good communicators, that aren't afraid to get their hands dirty, you know, being in the trenches with you, and, um, and, uh, and generally likable. <laughs> I, uh, it's really, really hard to motivate people to do things that they don't want to do um, if they don't like you. And, and again, I think the hard part is like a lot of people don't realize when they are a bad teammate or they are a bad leader. Um, and I think how you get there is just a lot of good, you know, self-reflection awareness of what your, what your strengths and your weaknesses are and how you've handled things in the past and did you get to the right outcome and why not? And look to yourself first is maybe the problem. Um, and then figure out what you're going to do to, to change that. And I think that, that I think it, you know, it should come naturally over time. Um, but then every now and then we all, you know, pair up with somebody who is just completely clueless of um, uh, how ineffective they are as uh, either a teammate or a leader. And it's probably because they, um, they don't reflect on enough and not really aware of their own um, strengths and weaknesses. Awesome. Uh, to wrap it up, final question. What are you most excited for about the upcoming Polaris Dawn mission that's maybe different from what you were originally excited for with Inspiration4? Yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, Inspiration4 was just to show it could be done. Um, you know, first time you didn't have world superpowers sending people into orbit. Um, you know, it was all about showing it could be done and do it in a very inspiring way with an amazing crew. You know, youngest uh, American that's been in space was on our crew, you know, childhood cancer survivor. Uh, grew up to, you know, be a medical professional at St. Jude, you know, uh, first black female pilot of a spacecraft, never gave up, you know, was a NASA runner-up, you know, uh, a space camp counselor, Air Force, uh, ICBM technician, um, you know, uh, became uh, one of our mission specialists. Um, that, that, that was the goal, inspire people what we can do in space and also what we can do here on Earth. Um, that's where St. Jude came in. But Polaris is different. Polaris is a test and developmental program. It's about doing things that haven't been done in a long time or never been done at all, um, with the idea of opening up space to the many, not, not just the few. Um, you know, the first mission Polaris Dawn will take us, you know, to the highest Earth orbit ever flown. It'll be a new EVA with a brand new spacesuit that maybe someday, you know, thousands of people will wear uh, an evolution of, um, you know, that doesn't cost hundreds of millions of dollars, um, a new communication network. But, but really, it's the end. It's the last mission. It's the first flight of Starship. I mean, that's the holy grail. That's a fully reusable first and second stage, rapidly reusable with, with two factories that are gonna be cranking these things out. I mean, it, this, this is like the DC-3 moment for human spaceflight when, when Starship comes online to put that much mass into orbit at such a low cost. Like, we don't know what the potential is. Like, it's, um, you think about like uh, car phones in the 1980s, and it's like, wow, that's obnoxious for rich Wall Street people. But then you fast forward like 20, 30 years, some of the most valuable companies now are, are not the, the manufacturers of the phones or the infrastructure, but it's the software applications that are on the phones. May not make our lives any better, but you just could never have imagined it to be. Um, and I think when you're able to bring the cost to accelerate mass to orbit down to such an extent, we have no idea what the future space economy, economy is or why we have hundreds or thousands of people in space, but it's, it's now possible. And also, Starship is what will bring humans for, uh, back to the moon. And if you can get to the moon, you can, you can probably get to Mars. So it's, um, it is going to be a real, um, a real transformational event um, for, I think, all of humankind once Starship comes online. And, and we're lucky that that's our, that's our last mission. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. Thank you.
Mr. Jared Isaacman and Cadet First Class Greenwood, thank you for your remarks and the time spent with us this evening. At this time, I would like to open the floor for questions. Attendees can ask questions at the microphones positioned in the audience. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, my name is uh, Major Clara Alcott from um, Arizona Wing Civil Air Patrol. And um, you flew with um, uh, Dr. Cyan Proctor. Yeah, she was a, a pilot, and um, her specialties were in, um, uh, she was an educator, and um, uh, she was promoting uh, art and creativity. What are your thoughts on the importance of those who can bring that kind of skill set um, into the environment you've described? Uh, I think it, it's, it's incredibly important, right? Uh, so uh, Dr. Proctor's uh, favorite uh, movie line is from uh, the movie Contact when uh, I think it was Jodie Foster said they should have brought a poet or sent a poet. And, uh, and Dr. Proctor happens to be a great poet and an artist. It is important. Um, look, we, we, have to, we have to keep branch, you know, pushing out further into space for a variety of reasons. Like, we, we, you know, whether it's... Um, you know, again, it's part of, you know, who we are, um, you know, as a species to want to go out and, and discover and learn, whether it's for economic reasons that we can't afford to miss out, um, you know, on whatever that next game-changing event is. Maybe it's mining, you know, helium-3 and we have a new source of power here. Whatever could be that future, um, you know, economy in space. Um, but, like, we are also, like, people. And... Um, and I don't think that uh, for all these reasons that we should be in space necessarily resonates with everyone. Like, uh, you know, making life multiplanetary doesn't, you know, doesn't click with everybody who, um, you know, would say we have like lots of real problems here on Earth or can't we take care of some of these other things? Um, and I think when you, when you have somebody like Dr. Proctor, who again, very talented educator among many other uh, things, but also an artist and poet can bring back a little bit of space for, for people here on Earth that maybe some of the other reasons I mentioned doesn't land with, but this does. Um, and then can maybe see a little bit of the importance of why it is okay for us to do both. Why we can still put the vast majority of our resources on making Earth a better place, um, but also not ignoring the opportunities or what our future could be like in, in space. Um, that's why I think like the, the role of the artist, the poet is, uh, is so important. Thank you, sir. Um, Major Cyan Proctor is also a member of Civil Air Patrol, so I know she was a huge inspiration to me. And, um, uh, and also her, her sharing that message of uh, hope and resiliency, uh, I know it's an inspiration to uh, a lot of people. Well, Thank you, sir. Glad to hear it. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, my name is Cadet Second Class Chancellor Roach. My question for you is, when you're such an integral leader in several different major national level companies, how do you find simply the energy and ability in yourself to manage and be a leader to all the people you're in charge of and you're responsible for? Uh, because at least it seems like, from my perspective, I can never imagine myself doing something as grandiose in terms of leading several different companies than being a mission um, for the inspiration and, uh, or going on the Polaris missions itself. So how do you personally like, find the ability to be a leader for everyone? Um. Well, I think it, the moment you kind of choose to be there, um, whether you're you know, running a company or being part of a crew going to space, any of these things, like once you make that choice, then all the obligations uh, come along with it. And um, like, I don't think it's a, I don't think you can choose to say that you wanna you know, embark on these kind of commercial space missions and, and be a bad leader. So I, I would hope that, you know, it, like to me, it's like once you make that choice, it's the obligation and you find a way to deliver. And that's like being inspirational when you have to be inspirational. It's, um, it's navigating like the, the challenging times when things go the wrong way. Um, I guess what I'd say is like, you no longer, um, you no longer have the choice not to, I would think, um, you know, live up to the expectation. It's just, um, it's an obligation at that point. So, um, and one that like really fortunate to be in. And, um, and if, if you can't do it, then probably probably shouldn't be there. So, uh. Thank you, sir. 
Sir, my name is Cadet Fourth Class Unterreiner. Um, I had a question concerning how you plan on uh, making the efficiency for space travel effective uh, using newer technologies like nuclear and nanotechnology. Do you uh, predict that that's going to be integral to the future of space travel? Uh, well, I'm certain that there are um, far smarter people in the room uh, to probably weigh in on that question than, than myself. What I'd say is like, I, I, I believe we're probably getting very close to the limitations of chemical propulsion. And um, that still affords a, um, a I think a, a, very, a very decent portion of our solar system to explore. Um, I think that right now you probably have physiological and psychological limitations that are greater than, um, you know, the technology, um, you know, affords. So like, you, you know, it's probably, I mean, I, I'm very sure the technology would enable us to explore, you know, beyond Mars. Um, and you're, again, I think you'd run into, again, you know, um, physiological and psychological limitations of it. That said, we, our ambition should be far grander uh, than what is within the reach of, of chemical propulsion. And I think you have to start experimenting on, on uh, alternative forms of propulsion. There were experiments in the past um, that uh, I don't know if they all went uh, well. You know, the 60s was a really good time to try anything, I guess. And, um, but they have to do it again. I, I mean, realistically, I think it, it creates like an interesting problem, right? I mean, in chemical propulsion, you're shedding mass the entire time. Uh, so the mass of the object you're trying to decelerate when you eventually get there is less. Um, I don't know if that would uh, necessarily be the case in nuclear propulsion, but that's something, like it, you just, you have to put energy towards it. Like I, I don't think you can afford not to because like we're not the only ones, um, you know, putting energy and resources into, into space flight, right? I, I, I think like, you know, space is, well, high ground has always been incredibly important. Space is the high ground, it's becoming you know, it's ever expanding high ground and we're not the only ones going for it. So like, um, what I would hate is uh, somebody else to have a real technological breakthrough that um, enhances their capabilities, whether it's deep exploration or just the efficiency of how they're able to operate, um, you know, in, uh, in, in low earth orbit or, or, or beyond. That would be, um, I think, something we can't afford to, to miss out on. So I certainly hope there's a fair amount of study resources being invested in this as, um, it seems like you can't afford to be to get it wrong. Thank you. Hello, I'm C3C Aiden Doherty from Cadet Squadron A. So you mentioned in your um, discussion that like you value competition in space and that competition is very important in the free market. However, I have had more of a question about cooperation between like private space companies. So <clears throat> like right now, like the EU just like passed a bill making Apple use USB-C instead of their Thunderbolt cords. So like, we don't have a thousand different cords in the world. And I was more asking like a question about how much value do you see like in cooperation to prevent like a thousand different like orbital reefs from every single different space company or like five different launch pads on the moon from SpaceX and Sierra Space and like all the other space companies? Uh, look, you'd love to say like amongst like commercial entities you can you can have good cooperation, but they have a lot at stake, right? Uh, I don't think there's, there, there is not a profitable commercial space company at all. Uh, they're all making huge investments right now. Uh, returns are, are far from certain. So as a result, I think that does limit to some extent the degree of cooperation that can, you know, reasonably take place. Now, here's what else I'd say is like, I, I think, you know, there's some good economic forces at work right now. Unfortunately, and fortunately, you had this extraordinary time where there was an influx of capital in a, you know, at the conclusion of a 15-year zero interest rate environment in 01, where you know, a number of you know, space-related companies were well-funded and, and put a lot of names up there for discussion. We've now pendulum swung into like, an incredibly unaccommodating economic climate where interest rates are substantially higher for companies that, again, generally don't, don't make money. So, I think you're going to find that, like the, um, you know, the number of potential players, whether they're, you know, um, uh, jamming up low Earth orbit with uh, lots of space stations or lots of launch pads, probably, probably won't happen. I think it'll thin out quite considerably. Um, uh, that's that's not to say that there's like one winner, because I I don't, 
entirely believe that. I think there's certainly one company that's got a, a tremendous lead that's going to be very hard to encroach upon, but there's other problems to be solved. Um, but I don't think it'll be as like, um, you know, saturated, if you will. Um, and by the way, like they, you know, they, the government certainly, you know, the government is the largest customer, hands down, and if they want cooperation, they'll have it. Um, I mean, even now, you know, with the SLS system, you have Lockheed and Boeing that have all built components to it. Um, I'm quite sure for at least some period of time for, you know, NASA astronauts returning to the moon, you're going to see contributions from a number of good, um, you know, defense and aerospace related companies. But yeah, I guess to say is like, as much as it sounds good, there are limitations on how much collaboration, cooperation you can have when, you know, it's life or death for some companies. Thank you, sir. Good evening, sir. Uh, I'm Cadet 4th Class Zimmerman from Cadet Squadron 37. I was just wondering, on more of a personal level, uh, did you have like an aha moment or a role model that made you inspire your dream of space flight rather than like continuing through shift four? Uh, I'm sorry, I only caught part of it. Did I, you asked me like, did I have like, like an overview effect moment or? Like, like what, was, what was your inspiration to continue to pursue this dream rather than um, like continue in finance or a similar? Uh, entrepreneurial career. So I think it, it was just like having that kind of parallel aviation um, career that, uh, I mean, to me, that's flying is always, I mean, it's, it's the challenge. Uh, it's, it's therapeutic. Like I never was giving that up and always was seeking out greater challenges. That's what brought me to air show flying. It's what resulted in, you know, creating Draken International. Um, so as long as that was part of my life, I felt like there was, um, you know, sufficient access to this, this commercial space industry that at least it was in the realm of possible. Um, and um, like I said, my first exposure to it was in 2008. The opportunity didn't, didn't come until 2020 um, at probably like the most, like the earliest moment like you could reasonably imagine. And um, yeah, so uh, I guess because the door was never, I, I guess never shut that I never like really gave up on it, but I also, knew I'd, a lot of things would, the stars would have to align to be lucky enough for it to ever happen. And again, just got really lucky there. All right, thank you. We have time for one last question. Good evening, sir. I'm C3C Carissa Sigler. As you mentioned before, it's extremely challenging for people to get into the astronaut program. I was wondering what advice you would give to a young person who's trying to pursue that career. That's a good question. Well, look, the, the good news is, is that starships are coming. Um, and, and look, there, and, and obviously you have Blue Origin has a substantial amount of resources that they'll invest in their vehicle and Rocket Labs is, so it's like in general, there's still, there's a lot of great companies out there that have the financial means and continuing to invest towards all sorts of capabilities in space, including human spaceflight. That said, go back to Starship being the DC-3, I mean, I, I, uh, I was on a tour about 10 months ago in Starbase at one of the factories, and I, I had to stop everybody who was on the tour because we were in the nose cone um, manufacturing hangar. And I was like, just so everybody is aware, that we're surrounded by six nose cones. It means there's six starships. And how exciting is that? Because they were probably making them every two weeks. I mean, they're building a sep second factory for starships in, uh, in KSC. And, and the idea that, you know, you could have a fully reusable first and second stage that comes back, lands at the launch pad. It's not, it, you know, it gets caught by these chopsticks arms. These might sound crazy, but they've been landing rockets on ships for, for, you know, almost eight years now. Like this, this type of sci-fi stuff is possible. You, you could have launches going up, uh, for every one of these in over a span of hours. That, that's that's going to change the game entirely in terms of the number of people who are going to have access to space. It's again, it won't be the few; it'll be the many. And there's and and they're and they're going to need personnel um, to support these missions. Um, you know, I, I personally think like the medical field is going to be the highest in demand um, because the reality is 100% of people feel different in space. 50% feel really bad and need to be treated, but the other 50% don't feel great, and it takes some time to um, to acclimate, if you will. Um, our mission, even with four crew members, has a medical professional. 50% of my crew on the last mission had space adaptation syndrome, needed um, various medication. So I, I think that'll be a very high demand field. Certainly, you know, software engineers, hardware engineers, the farther you get away from Earth, uh, the transmission delay kind of takes the, you know, traditional mission control concept off the table. 
Um, and it's not going to entirely be solved through automation. You're going to need you know, you know, humans in the loop to help troublesh troubleshoot you know, some of these situations on long duration flights like to, um, to Mars, for example. So the answer is like the, 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 num the number of opportunities are going to increase you know, by orders of magnitude. And we're not, we're not having to wait that long. I mean, it's not even been three, three years since uh, human spaceflight has been re restored with the Demo 2 flight. Um, and we're already getting ready to launch Crew 6 this weekend. There's two commercial missions. That Starship first flight could be a month away. And when it happens, I think there's going to be dozens of these lining up to uh, prove out the technology and eventually become that DC-3 that I think we're, we're all hoping it to be. And that's just a lot of opportunity. It's exciting. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Mr. Isaacman, thank you again for your time today. Your experiences and perspectives speak to how we can reimagine leadership and inspire teamwork. On behalf of the U.S. Air Force Academy and our National Character and Leadership Symposium, please accept this token of our gratitude. The base of this gift is made from marble from our terrazzo. This is significant to us because all cadets have to run the marble strips during their freshman year. We hope you will look on this and rem remember your NCLS experience fondly. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. This concludes our session. Cadets, please check in for this session using the posted QR code. Symposium dinner participants, please join us for the speaker social in the McComas Lounge, followed by dinner in the Arnold Hall Ballroom. Thank you all, have a great evening, and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow morning for the first sessions beginning at 8 a.m.